So we're here to talk about carbon capture and storage. That is, uh, as the IPC says, an essential technology in reaching net zero. And what we want to talk about today is how can we accelerate this? Are we doing enough? Are we going fast enough? And how can we accelerate it? So I'm really delighted that we've got an excellent panel here. Um, and as it's late in the evening, what I'm going to ask is for each of them just to say a couple of words about why they think CCUS is important and why it needs to be accelerated uh, and, and what are the key, sort of their key thoughts on how to achieve that. So I'm Ruth Herbert, I'm Chief Executive of the Carbon Capture and Storage Association. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce uh, Professor Piers Forster from the Climate Change Committee. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's fantastic to be here today. So I have two jobs. I, I have come to COP on behalf of the IPCC to present the science, and I also currently chair the UK Climate Change Committee. And, and just as Ruth said in her introduction, Carbon dioxide removal is in a is in a essential part of the not only the pathway to net zero to keep below one and a half degrees, but but it's also very 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 important afterwards as well. We have to continue to in, increase the amount of removal right up to 2100 and so that's on behalf of the IPCC if you look at the decarbonisation pathways and, 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 and then our job on the Climate Change Committee is to translate that into the decarbonisation pathway for our country uh, and I think things like the Climate Change Committee can be fantastic, uh, uh, really trying to set out that long-term kind of pathway uh, and to, to, to really try and give governments that kind of longer-term perspective. Thank you, Piers. So let's move on to Catherine Rohr from SSE Thermal. Hi, yes, I'm... Uh, from SSC. So SSC is a power utility in the UK. Um, we're trying to position ourselves as the clean energy champion of UK and Ireland. Uh, we're building the largest offshore wind farms in the world. Uh, we've just um, energised Sea Green and uh, we're in the process of um, building actually with GE turbines, um, uh, uh, Dogger Bank. Uh, we are a networks company, so we're investing in the networks across the UK in order to be able to take that renewable power. And we also run flexibility. Um, and so I am responsible for 7.5 gigawatts of gas generation, uh, gas power. And so the key for me and my business is how do you decarbonize the hard-to-abate part of the power system? And given our position across the electricity system, what we can tell is that a renewables-led power system is going to need large-scale flexibility to back up um, when it's not windy and when it's not sunny. Uh, and so trying to find a route in order to do that, uh, both cost-effectively and quickly, is the challenge that faces us. And so I think the CCC has identified we need at least 10 gigawatts of low-carbon flexible capacity. Um, and the way we're looking at that is power CCS and also through hydrogen to power, which will depend on CCS as well via blue hydrogen if we're going to get to the decarbonisation of the UK power system by 2035. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Pierre, you're working on storage. Yes, good, good evening, everyone. Um, so I work with Neptune Energy. We are uh, historically and still an ENP company, but we're trying to do it uh, responsibly. So essentially, we have the ambition to uh, store by 2030 more CO2 than is associated with our scope one, two, and three. Um, so that's a big number. Um, and I guess we are progressing the development of storages in the UK, but also in the Netherlands and Norway, 
which really is giving us a, a good uh, opportunity to compare and contrast different approaches in terms of uh, um, ways of, um, of, of approaching the market and also in terms of um, CO2 uh, pricing. And, and I guess, you know, the topic being out, can we accelerate? I think a key element to consider is, is very much the, the cost of CO2 and, and the certainty of cost so that you can have a sort of, uh, um, you know, sufficient uh, horizon to really spend a lot of capex that's required to, uh, to decarbonize and to develop transportation and storage solutions. Thanks, Pierre. So, Hannah, um, your perspective? Yes, so we in Arca Carbon Capture, we are attending COP28 for the main reason of really conveying the message that we are constructing and delivering carbon capture today. So we say it's beyond PowerPoint, and I think that is a crucial message these days when we are talking a lot, but it's not often followed up by ambition, and we really need to accelerate pace. And we're delivering uh, now in uh, carbon capture in three quite different segments within the hard debate industries. So uh, we are constructing the world's very first carbon capture facility at a cement plant, knowing the impact it has on the global emissions in total, uh, 6 to 8%. Uh, we know that this is a crucial sector to decarbonize. Uh, the second one is a waste to energy plant in the, in the Netherlands. And the third one is a bioenergy plant in uh, Denmark, uh, enabling negative emissions. Joe, you're looking at power with CCS. Hello. Um, yes, I work with, uh, with GE. I lead our gas power business for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Um, so, you know, in the simplest terms, in the, the value chain, I think thinking about the whole value chain of what does it mean, right? You have to capture the carbon from uh, large emitting plants. Uh, obviously, power generation is, is a sector that, that is contributing to that. Um, we've just recently submitted a bid for a combined high efficient combined cycle power plant along with an attached um, carbon capture plant so so yes I agree with you it's there I think the technology has has been there for a long time and you have to think about all the components of it the the capturing of it the compression the transportation and then ultimately the storage or the utilization and that requires that entire value chain to come together to cooperate uh, to enable this. I think the second piece is around, um, you know, commercializing this at large scale um, and how do we bring the cost curve down. I think that is where, um, you know, when governments are involved, driving incentives to, to enable that, um, we're going to see this deployed at large scale. Yeah, thank you. Julie. Uh, good evening. I'm Julie Kranga from uh, Technip Energies. Uh, we are providing uh, technologies and solutions for, for the energy, in particular the energy transition. And uh, uh, when it comes to um, CCUS, uh, I'd like to convey two messages. The first one is uh, it's not a one-man show. We need alignment of many stakeholders along the value chain. Uh, in fact, a lot of us on, in this panel, we need to work together to, to make it happen. Uh, plus, we need the regulators, uh, and plus, we need the banks. So it's really a, a full ecosystem to, to put in place. Um, second, we, this, this industry is still uh, nascent, uh, and we need to um, accumulate a number of uh, successes. So, Whatever we can implement now, we need to implement. We need to increase the experience rate to get the cost down. Uh, so some technologies are already proven at scale today. These are the I mean, technology. We need to deploy them as fast as possible while working on the technologies of tomorrow. So just coming to the, the discussion, I guess, um, we've seen most of the projects going forward at the moment ha have got government support and there are different sort of frameworks for that, whether that's direct government support, whether that's um, carbon, uh, a, a carbon tax that drives that, or whether that's maybe um, tax rebates that drives that, as we're seeing in the US. But um, how quickly do you see us moving beyond that kind of government for support for projects and actually getting into a commercial situation where... Um, CCS is going forward without subsidy. Is that is that ever going to be possible? And, and what 
I guess, what do we mean by, by subsidy in this context? How about I start with, the, with, with answering that question? So I think, um, at least at this point, we haven't got the maturity of the system, the integrated system, to even start considering, you know, removing subsidy. Mm -hmm. And the level of subsidy across that system is still significant. So you need to mature your transport and storage system, your store, to the point that it's capable of accepting any type of emitter. So therefore, you need that regulation and that subsidy to be able to incentivize that system to become mature. And then as an emitter, and speaking as a power emitter, you need to be subsidized ultimately to, to bring it in line and to make a power CCS station within the merit order of alternative and particular unabated technologies because the cost of carbon isn't high enough yet. Yeah. So, so high level, I would say, the maturity of the system isn't there yet. At the point that you then have choice and you have multiple emitters that can connect into a system, that's the point at which you become competitive. And just to finish off, I would also say, what is your definition of subsidy? Because whether you're an industrial emitter or a power or any other type of emitter, on the whole, there is some form of government mechanism, be it tax break, be it capacity mechanism, be it industrial investment that is encouraging you to even want to take part in this. And I think there'll be a very, very long time uh, before that kind of government underwriting disappears. Piers? Um, I, yeah, I... I I want to confirm what we, yeah, I thought you answered ex, 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 excellently really there, kind of Catherine, but just to confirm what we say at the kind of Climate Change Committee, we say this, ultim, this ultimately ought to be supported by something like a kind of carbon tax of some kind, or the, or the ETS, but, 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 but that sort of support isn't going to is it going to get the infrastructure built that we would have to build everywhere? So, so there has to be something something additional the government does, but it doesn't have to be just the kind of government. It can also be through offsetting and things like that can potentially support these technologies at the beginning of their time frame, but we don't necessarily see a particularly big role for those offsets. Yeah. Um, Helen? There might not be one specific set of, of a framework that would work for all segments in all regions. I think this probably will differ uh, across. Uh, I, I mean, just the example of the carrot and stick, uh, Europe versus the, the US, is a good example of that, and also the opportunity on how it's a, uh, possible to stack different schemes together. So again, it's the combination of the different tools in the toolbox uh, that will make this move forward. Um, and I think, but I think what is typical across the different segments and for the meters is the challenge around the uncertainty there's so little predictability. And I think that at that, uh, this stage is keeping us back probably also to move forward on those cases that would be possible because they're expecting that something is going to happen, but if I'm the first mover, will I lose some of my compatibility uh, or capabilities uh, that my close followers will get and I will lose out on? Yeah. Thank you. Talking about future technology and where that's going to lead, um, certainly the 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 carrot and the stick, right? So there's there are incentives. GE has tapped into some funding in the U.S. with the Department of Energy. So with that, we're we're doing a feed study on direct air capture. Um, we also have collaborations with other companies that are looking at um, a solid based technology that will hopefully reduce the, it'll improve the efficiency first of all, and it'll reduce the cost significantly of what it would take to actually capture rather than using an amine-based um, solution. So, so that I think is, is something that will, will, as I referenced earlier, drive the cost curve, eventually commercialize at scale um, to enable this um, further. 
I'm just wondering, Pierre, does, does that sort of future higher carbon price, is that enough for storage developers? Or you've got to develop stuff really ahead of time uh, for when it's needed. So what are, what are you looking for in terms of that longer term certainty? Well, I, I, I guess the, um, uh, it depends on the application and depends sort of on the sector in terms of the total cost of the chain. Um, I think the, the countries where you have uh, a set tax, a tax set at a sufficiently high level and an increasing trajectory, I think that's giving potentially the right signals. Um, I guess in terms of pace, um, it's, um, it's probably not going fast enough, but because you know that's what that's what we hear. We are behind. Um, it's not moving. But then I guess it's it's back to the fact that it's it's a cost. Right? It's a, it's an added cost to everything we use every day. Um, so that probably why you know until you have maybe other tools like a low carbon product standard that you know we've we've talked about and um, or other incentives, um, it's difficult to see how it's going to take off. Um, and there's also the fact that uh, the emitters essentially they're trying to minimise this cost, so they are kind of in some countries, waiting to see what's, what's happening and uh, who's going to provide the lowest cost storage, um, which doesn't help anybody because then sort of nobody moves. So, um, yeah, I, I suppose maybe the NZIA in, in Europe is a good tool that's being introduced to essentially try and unlock the situation by uh, essentially forcing companies who have produced uh, oil and gas in, uh, in sort of the past few years to develop stores. So let's see, let's see what, um, what comes out of that. Yeah, and we've actually put some papers on the seats about uh, a project that we've been doing with Oxford Net Zero Markets and Mandates, which is just looking at, okay, this, this question that we've all got, which is, 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 is the global carbon market getting there quickly enough, quick enough, and going to be powerful enough to drive investment in these kind of projects, large-scale billions of pounds projects, or are other, other mechanisms needed, and whether that's low carbon product standards, carbon border adjustment mechanisms with a stronger ETS trading scheme for, for CO2, or whether it's mandates on different sectors of the economy or on, on production of, of hydrocarbons. This is the sort of thing that I think people are now discussing because they're concerned that actually things aren't moving quickly enough. You know, global carbon market's a great idea, but if it's that's not here now, it's not going to drive investment in projects for the 2030 targets, and they're the first ones we've got to meet. And then 2035, we've got to double the volume and so forth. So, yeah. Julie, did you, I mean, because also you're looking at CO2 capture for fuels and things like that, so then you've got different sectors of the economy on different pathways where, um, yeah, we, mm. we, we, we might see uh, sustainable aviation fuel mm. coming forward mm. as well. So we see more and more of our clients, uh, they see um, carbon capture as a way to have a license to operate in the future, being in the power industry or for cement uh, with its low, but there is a market for green cement that is uh, building up. Um, another reason why this industry has a great future is because of CO2 utilization which will remain a, only a fraction of the CO2 that is captured, but that it's absolutely a must to feed other value chain, in particular the sustainable aviation fuel, where we see a new regulation that uh, will force the implementation of, uh, of this value chain, as we need to have 28% uh, of the fuel that is served by 2015 uh, in Europe. Uh, so this will as well uh, drive uh, the economics of this, of this value chain, the demand. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would just like to link uh, CCU, CCU back to the challenge of the infrastructure, because that is actually part of the discussions that we are seeing when we are meeting emitters around in Europe. It's actually that the lack of possibilities to store at the early days uh, sort of drives forward the CCU uh, cases. So an example of the waste energy plant that I mentioned to begin with in, in the Netherlands, there's no way for them to store. It's a, it's a, a 100,000 a year emissions, and we know the challenges of connecting small, medium-sized emitters to any storage these days. 
Um, but they see the opportunity to use uh, the, uh, the CO2 to displace the use of natural gas in the greenhouses in the region. Uh, and just by, by starting on, on of, uh, of this end, it's the opportunity then to move forward uh, once there are infrastructure in the region and they see other opportunities, other needs to sort of move the, the CO2 elsewhere, if that is the better case for the, for the climate. Thank you. So I'm really keen to kind of open up. We've got a small room here, so I'd like to have a bit more of a conversation. Does anyone have any questions for the panel about the technology, about the challenges we've talked about? Yeah. Do you have a, a mic? Yeah, uh, John Kirsten, Arco Carbon Capture. Uh, uh, maybe a, a question for, for Catherine. Um, we, we see uh, here at COP a lot of talk about um, that we the decarbonization shouldn't be about decarbonizing uh, the power sector because they should find other reasons. What, what, you know, when you meet those type of of uh, what to say pushback, you know, what what what, what do you guys in SSE see there? I think it's this, the phrase people use is you should focus on hard to abate sectors. But what people don't realize is the power sector has a hard to abate element in it. So of course, you know, the scale should be in building out renewables. I don't think anyone disagrees with that. And it should be building out the networks in order to feed those renewables. But what, what seems to have missed everyone, and it's pr primarily I think because there's a lack of understanding of how the electricity systems work across countries is that they need to be stable and they need to be 24 7 and that's what flexibility provides and batteries cannot provide long duration flexibility you know two weeks the last two weeks have been cold in the uk guess what all our gas power stations have been running base load and it's those kind of issues and so it's not about competing against other industries for investment it's about understanding where anchor demand can come from you know, a good example for power is that there is a target to decarbonize the power system in a lot of different countries. In the UK, it's 2035, and potentially if we get a new government, it's 2030. So you have a reg highly regulated utility sector that is willing to take a risk on decarbonizing, which you don't necessarily see in other industries, steels, chemicals, etc. And the second one is that you have mechanisms that already exist, whether it's the capacity mechanism, now dispatchable power agreements. These structures already exist to be able to incentivize and pay for the additional cost of bringing that technology in. So from our perspective, we understand why power isn't the logical place to start. But if it then brings other to you, if it allows the TNS system to get built, then it can act as an anchor demand source. And so that's why we, as a power company, push for CC Power CCS to be part of that prioritization. But just to finish off your question, and also it's another topic, I do think when it comes to government subsidy, governments have to prioritize. And they have to choose what areas they want to capture carbon from first. And they have to understand what is dictating that. Is it the store? So one of the things that we're learning as we build or attempt to build power CCS plants is that the store maturity governs whether or not it can cope with dispatchable intermittent CO2. So if your focus is just to get a transport and storage system up and running as quickly as possible, well, then you should fo focus on baseload type emitters. And that should be where the subsidy goes towards. Now, I shouldn't be saying that because that's not good for me. But at least then it would mature your TNS system very fast. And people like me would stop wasting money trying to invest and get companies like GE to come up with, you know, feeds for these things. Because we'll just say, okay, we'll wait five years until those systems are mature. So that's point one. Point two is, or do you focus on policy? And if policy says you have a decarbonized power system, then you tell the TNS co you have to accept intermittent CO2 and deal with it. It's your problem, not ours. So I do think there is a real need for clarity on what is the priority when you're building these CCS systems. That's me off my soapbox. Um, there's, 
Oh, sh sure, Piers, but... Well, yeah, uh, I just wanted to put in context of what we on the kind of Climate Change Committee do think will be the solution for the kind of UK. So, so we think by the time you get to that kind of 20, kind of 50 time period or the kind of 20, 30, kind of 5 time period when we decarbonize the electricity supply, we still have about 5 or 10 percent would be cash with carbon capture in some way. Uh, uh, to, um, we then think there's a case to develop can, can blue hydrogen technology, te technology potentially as, a, as more of a kind of great way to developing green hydrogen infrastructure in some way. But I think the solution would be different in different countries. So, so I don't even necessarily expect every country to have the same sort of energy. Okay, we have another question in the audience. Yes, I'm actually a banker, actually, coming from the financial uh, entity. Uh, a question to uh, maybe Mr. Ms. Rowan or whoever can answer my questions. Um, we, yes, definitely we do need ca uh, subsidies for or incentive schemes for the CapEx. Uh, also the uh, carbon pricing for to cover the, the OPEX and, and have the, the revenues in. Now, um, from the financier's point of view, still, we, we have a numbers of risks that needs to be assessed. One of uh, the major points that I see is the project-to-project the project risk, especially if you have many different players within the whole uh, chain. And so uh, my first question is how you, if you, if you have any secrets <laughs> to go over this project-to-project project risk, I'd like to uh, understand, that's one. Two, insurance product. Uh, as a banker, we do need insurance, otherwise it's not possible for us to provide any finance. Uh, are there anything coming out in this market that you could uh, share with us? Uh, okay, let's start with the, with the first one. So, an important aspect, of course, of deployment of CCS, the full value chain, is cost. It's cost on the capture, it's cost on the transport infrastructure and storage. And how we are moving towards the targets that we have set to reduce costs in the short term period is to really to be more standardized and modularized on our product size. Uh, product uh, delivery, sorry. This enables us to reduce the risk. Uh, we get to practice, right, from project to project. We know what is to, to be delivered and really focusing on the parts that interconnects the solution to the different emitters. And as such, we could also then deliver on the customer needs. Uh, and on the second part of the, of the insurance, I need to look to, in, the, in my panel here and see if there's... Yeah. <laughs> maybe I can try. Um, I guess maybe back to the first point as well before I go, uh, move on to insurance. Um, I've, I've, I think it's, it's a big problem, right, to line up um, sort of the milestones of a number of major capital projects. I mean, usually when you have one major capital project, you're very lucky if you meet your milestones, but when you have two or three that needs to align, it's a bit like, you know, wishing for, I don't know, a miracle. Um, and, 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 it, and it feels like, like um, you know, having also looked at sort of um, um, project financing, etc., that actually this is probably the wrong solution, except, except if, you know, except in the cases where you have uh, sort of uh, a system like in the UK, where essentially it's, it's the government who's kind of, you know, setting up a TNS system and essentially underwriting, in a way, um, you know, the... Uh, all, all the different elements, in which case it's a lot more bankable and it's a lot more uh, acceptable. I mean, even in the Netherlands, for example, if you take the Portos project, essentially you got the underwriting of, of the Dutch government, etc. So it, it was possible, I believe, to uh, project finance it. But if you do it on a pure merchant system, then the best is probably to do it on your, on your equity. And then once it's developed, you can refinance. Um, well, that's what we, we found. And I, I guess for, for the liability and the insurance, um, 
Yes, the sooner the better. We, as soon as we can have uh, an insurance market, the, the better. And, but I think I think we should bear in mind that um, this is not new, right? We I guess we keep on saying it, but we have to say it again. Uh, it's been done. It's been done, right? Uh, the capture has been done for a number of years. Uh, you know, Equino is, is repeating it often enough, but it's not only Equino who's done it. Um, in fact, we've done it as well in the Netherlands, different scale, but we were doing it and injecting it. So this has all been done. Uh, it's just the scale that's different, right? And, uh, and also the scale and the pace and the fact that you're not doing it to commercialize a valuable product. It's pure waste. Um, right? Because I guess historically it was done to commercialize a valuable product, the hydrocarbon. Um, so that's, that's a huge, huge difference. Um, but it's, because it's been done, we, have, we should bear in mind that the risks are very low. Well, we know what we're doing, you know, and, and the, the risk of leakage are extremely low. And, and, and that's what, you know, we've been doing in the oil and gas business for years and years and years. And sometimes you have things that go wrong, uh, if I can sort of, uh, in one minute. Sometimes you have things that go wrong, but you have solutions to fix them. And which means that even if there was something going wrong, it would be quickly fixed. And it would be you know, a very small negative impact compared to a very large positive impact. So I think that's what we have to repeat and, and, and communicate and over communicate. And, and I appreciate it's a big worry, um, but, but really um, I, wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't lose sleep on that. I, I think there are a lot worse. But not doing anything is a lot worse. Yeah. If I may complement, I'm sorry. Um, those uh, CC West projects are infrastructure projects, uh, but um, we can think about those with a new business model that were uh, not implemented for the oil and gas business because the nature of the clients was quite different from what we see with cement player or West to energy players, for example. Um, so we are currently discussing with banks, and we are not the only one, about new models like carbon capture as a service, um, taking equity in those developments, which we have never done as a, uh, an EPC company in the oil and gas business. So risk sharing is something that needs to be uh, uh, considered for, for those new, new developments, in addition to reassuring everyone about the, the storage. <laughs> Um, another question. Hi, I'm Mac from the International CCS Knowledge Center. Um, it's an iterative process to reduce costs for the projects. And uh, you, you're very well aware that every different project gives you the opportunity to learn from your mistakes. Um, I, I think that there is a lot of room for collaboration. It's a global problem. It's a, really important that we're learning from these mistakes at a at a, a wider range, and especially for emerging economies, things like that, to be able to participate in CCS. Um, I just would love to hear you guys just discuss anything in terms of collaboration that you'd like to see, any different topics that you'd like to see collaboration on, and feel free to say the CCCA, CCSA is doing a terrific job. I'm sure you could, uh, they wouldn't mind saying that, so. I just realized that I haven't mentioned Longship Project at all so far in the discussion. And of course, that is a hugely important project because it really beats this the chicken and egg uh, discussion that it's just unavoidable uh, when we're discussing CCS. And that is that the Norwegian government uh, funded the realization of the full value chain in one go. So both uh, the capture and the storage uh, part of it. And part of sort of de delivering on that project is also to have the value realization. So uh, continuously it's expected from the parties of that project to share insights, learnings, to be out there and speak about what is going on. And I think that is really the best we could do to learn from these first, uh, first of our kind projects moving forward, even though I agree the technology is there, but it, this is about the scaling and getting the full value chain up and running in one go. So I think that is the start. Yeah, and just to come in, Chair's prerogative, I think this com the commercial learning is really important as well. So actually, how do you take um, multiple final investment decisions around a common shared infrastructure? H how do you, as an emitter or carbon capturer, going forward, kind of look at your own business case alongside others in your region and kind of 
take that plunge? Um, how do you um, understand how, how the network's going to evolve and develop and, and the role that that plays in planning your own future investments and things like that? This is all kind of new territory. So what we're doing in the CCSA is we've got members across the value chain and we've got the end users as well. And a lot of them, you know, especially the industrial end users, they're not used to kind of having to, to really think about the evolution of a new network or to think about kind of um, how to plan their, the evolution of their assets in line with this infrastructure. So sharing all of that and going on that journey together. And I think what the clusters have learned over the last few years and having to sort of think as a team even competitors and and people serve as providers to each other in the same in the same industry um, about how to share the journey has, has been quite interesting and I think that's something we're really keen to share with other people. That's why we're here at COP together, but also you know just we can see other countries are, are, are develop, starting to develop these clusters, and I think it's going to be the same journey that, that they're going to have to to go on with this. Um, and we've seen, I mean, in the US as well, development of of hubs is a big topic, right, Joe? So I think learnings, there's a lot of focus on getting things done as quickly as possible, but do you see that there's going to be a lot of learnings as well? I, I do, absolutely. I mean, with any of these um, efforts, right, as you're, as you're launching the, um, the, the technology in an application, those learnings are going to be passed on. And, and to your point, yes, in, in the US, in Houston, um, there is a hub that's going to be there and looked at, and I think that's, there, there are going to be learnings from there that are going to be passed on. I do think you know, the commercial aspect is important as well. So today I've had meetings with, with customers here in the UAE that are um, in the aluminum segment, and you know, they, they, they do see a market for marketing green aluminum. And so they have an incentive to, to do that. Now, we've talked about, and I think Catherine touched on this, and it's the right approach, right, is you have to decarbonize the sectors, right? And, and that is a sector that is looking at it. So I do think some of the hard-to-abate sectors are incentivized purely from the economics of their market and their customers requiring that. Um, so all of those learnings together will continue. And, and as I said earlier, I think the... Um, the continued investment in, in R&D of technology um, will also continue to, uh, to, to improve and share those learnings across. Okay, yeah. One thing, just speaking from experience, so I would agree with all of that, and I would say they're very active, the UK having gone through one round of, of the track one process, you know, as someone that's in track two and also the track one expansion we've learnt from the experience of the first round. Um, what I would say is governments need to realise that collaboration is more important than competitive cost. You know, every government system is set up to push costs down and it assumes greater competition will do that. I actually think that's the opposite of the truth in CCS. The more the industry can collaborate, the faster it will be able to overcome the technical challenges and lower cost. And so government can help us by, you know, actually trying to avoid competition law, preventing you from sharing your learnings, which has been a real challenge for us, uh, even internally when we're in more than one track, to be able to actually leverage off the learnings. Um, so that would be my only feedback is, as industry, we're trying to collaborate, but we're dealing with mechanisms that actually explicitly don't want you to collaborate. Um, but that's for existing technologies rather than new technologies. Um, so, so, so within the UK government, the approach is the kind of contract for different idea, but that whole approach is inherently competitive. Mm -hmm. So, kind of, so, kind of, would you prefer an alternative for kind of carbon capture? <laughs> Well, it doesn't have to be competitive, right? It, it could just be allocated CFDs uh, in line with industrial strategy or whatever prioritisation well, the, the government has. That's the way the dispatchable yeah. power agreement works, yeah. which is, is it's not, except what they're telling us is that they want it to change over time. Yeah. But at the moment, when you negotiate a dispatchable power agreement, it's an open book. You say what your capex is, and then they give you a return. Not a very good one, by the way. Um, but um, but that's the way they structure the CFD. But it's it's 
what they want to prevent, and in order to lower that CFD, is ultimately you being able to go to multiple technology technology providers and saying, well, actually, let's think about what the best solution is here and who is the best positioned in order to do it. You're, you're explicitly not allowed to do that. Or you have to fund your own separate work streams and clean teams to be able to do it. So, so that's where you're sort of struggling. But um, anyway. Yeah. We have another question. Oh, we might have two. Just, just one more. If you oh. ever want a tour of the Boundary Dam CCS facility mm -hmm. in Saskatchewan, ask the UK government for money and we'll give you a <laughs> So Mark Clune from Air Products. I wanted to make one comment and then one question and want to build on what Pierre said and, and, and was going to say this before Pierre said it. Air Products, we've been capturing a million tons a year for the last 10 years from a project in, in, in the US. Um, it can be done, it is low risk. We've also taken in the last two years FID on probably about $10 billion worth of investments, which when they come on stream in the next two to three years, will between them capture another 6 million tons a year. So it can be done, so it can be done at scale. And so long as you know what you're doing, the risks should be relatively, relatively small and manageable. Moving on to my question, moving away from that plug for our products. Um, there's lots of different considerations. It's, uh, a lot of the panel are focused on, on perhaps Northern Europe. Uh, we've got a, a diverse audience in the room. Can each panelist mention one consideration that different geographies perhaps need to really look at long and hard that might not be obvious when they're deciding whether or not carbon capture and storage is right for them and, and what sort of carbon capture and storage solution is right for them? I'll answer it. So two things. One is, do you have storage capacity? So do you have the geology to be able to store it reasonably close by? And if not, can you export it to someone reasonably close by? And the other is, what is your alternative? And I think, you know, this goes to power. There's always, you know, I would encourage the alternative if ultimately it is less complicated, lower cost, and even if it doesn't lock in fossil fuels. You know, I would encourage an alternative, but when it comes to things where there is no alternative, and if you've got a store reasonably close, then CCS will probably be the quickest way of decarbonizing that sector, and so should be a priority. That would be for me. Thank you. Well, I, I guess maybe one consideration is, um, obviously, in many places, the starting point is with companies who have been involved in oil and gas, right? But not all the countries do have oil and gas resources. But I think even these countries have an opportunity because, um, in fact, you know, some of the good stores are not um, old or depleted oil and gas reservoirs. So I think this is an opportunity for some countries. And then if you combine that with uh, carbon removal and sort of a voluntary market. And I think that's, you know, that's something. In fact, I, earlier I was in another presentation where, um, uh, where in fact, you know, we were talking about sort of uh, in Kenya, how uh, they are considering um, uh, direct, direct air capture combined with uh, sort of green power and then storage in basalt. And, and because that's pure carbon removal, right? So that's, got, that's valuable from sort of companies who are willing to pay for it. So something to consider, maybe an opportunity. I think the only other thing I'd add is we talked about post-combustion, at least in the power gen space, and pre-combustion is also an alternative. Um, and today, GE has turbines. We have over 100 turbines around the world that are burning on some level of, of hydrogen, let's say, or low carbon um, fuels. Um, but again, the challenge there is, is similar in terms of some of the things that we're talking about, particularly infrastructure and the cost to, uh, to um, put that infrastructure in place to enable those low carbon fuels. Um, so, but from a, from a technology standpoint, the capability is there and um, you know, it's, it's just a matter of getting those low carbon fuel sources um, to those plants. 
I think that this is quite, I mentioned in the beginning how this, uh, there's no size fits all in terms of incentives and frameworks. I think this comes also to the decarbonization journey. It will very much, as, uh, to your point, uh, depend on uh, do you have access to storage. And I think for many meters, it's actually not so much about CCS that we tend to believe uh, that we're working in this field. It's actually very much about the site itself. Uh, what is the right sizing? of my company for the next 25, 30, 40 years. Uh, what is the right thing for us to do? What is the right mix? Uh, it's really a combination of the different decarbonization tools. Have I done my electrification of the parts that needs to do so? Have I done the fuel switching? And in the end, that is what is uh, coming down to the decision for the individual emitter and the individual side. Is there a final question? I uh, was just about to, to conclude as you ask all panelists to give you an Sorry, answer, so I don't want to disappoint you. I don't think Peter is gone either, but... Um, okay. uh, I'd like to go back to uh, first remark I made. Uh, we need this industry to ramp up, so I think a lot of technology and, and uh, services provider uh, focus right now where the conditions are made to deploy CCUS at scale which is mainly Northern Europe and North America. And the fastest we deploy there, the fastest we'll be able to deploy in other geographies because there will be this kind of uh, snowball effect. Uh, that said, we see a lot of development already in Asia and Middle East uh, when it comes to uh, pre-combustion particularly. And in Asia, the numbers of CCS hubs that are being developed in uh, Malaysia, uh, China, and elsewhere is, is quite impressive. So it's, um, it's coming, uh, maybe less in the spotlight, but uh, I mean, that it'll be there very soon. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm Rainy, and I'm heading the Bursa Carbon Exchange. And I'm glad that Julie, you talk about Malaysia. Because um, just two weeks ago, the Ministry of Economy organized the first CCUS conference. And I was very obliged to go and give a talk about the role of carbon markets in you know, um, facilitating CCUS. And I really don't have an answer for that. So my question to the panelists here is that, have you considered, um, you know, I, I know that VERA and Global Carbon Council, they are still developing their methodology for CCUS. But the point is that have you all considered at one point using, you know, the carbon markets for cost recovery? And for a country like Malaysia, we are not developed countries, we are developing countries. How else can we finance? Is the carbon market going to be viable? We have corporates who are willing to pay a lot for one ton of the direct air capture as well as the bioenergy with the CCS. But this is different when we talk about carbon capture from you know, fossil fuel or from the wellhead. It's a different paradigm and I'm not sure whether it's the market willing to pay for this kind of a scene industry. Thank you. Okay, if I may, because I think I have a good, uh, good example of how the voluntary carbon market is driving this industry forward. As earlier this year, uh, we were able to gather with our partners in Microsoft and Ørsted to move that project forward, a uh, bioenergy plant, uh, and as such, uh, enabling uh, negative emissions and carbon removal credits. And Microsoft, uh, on the buyer side, uh, together with funds from the Danish state, is what really enabled this project to move forward uh, at this stage, and, and also then connected to storage in the Northern Lights. Um, yeah. So that is sort of the, the physical value chain, and then you mentioned Vera. Uh, as part of this project, we are also uh, working together. Uh, it's, there's an organization called CCS Plus, yes. And we are applying this project as an example project on this methodology uh, to see how, uh, what is sort of uh, the documentation that is required to get in place uh, to get the certified uh, carbon credits in the end, which of course is an important enabler for this product. I actually have a very quick comment because from the bioenergy CCS, that is actually a net negative technology. But if you're talking about, you know, um, capturing from coal and gas plant or the wellhead, uh, do, do you potentially find any buyers who might be willing to pay for it? Because bioenergy otherwise by itself is a net zero. 
but with the CCS, you are making it actually net negative. But if you are going to capture it from gas and coal plant and all the head, I'm not sure whether it will, will there be any demand for these credits. No, <laughs> is the answer. <laughs> sure, very briefly, no, uh, because we have none. So the only thing you're saving is the cost of carbon. So the, your competitive position is that ultimately you're not having to, your power price or your spark spread, so power price minus gas plus carbon is ultimately how we make money. And so the benefit of CCS is you don't have to pay for the carbon cost. At the moment, though, the cost of carbon is too low to incentivize you to put in the capital infrastructure in order to capture the carbon, which is why you're having to get a government incentive. So, so it's the flip side to that carbon market that we're benefiting on. But no one will... We're not... Ad, as you say, we're, we're removing carbon, but we're just getting ourselves back to zero or actually to 3%. Um, we're, not, we're not negative. But if, if I may, maybe one idea, although that might be a bit controversial, is uh, I know some countries are actually using the production sharing agreement framework to fund um, sort of carbon capture and storage, um, and which in a way is like an additional cost for the oil and gas producers. Um, and I think the the beauty of that, if, if it works the way I'm thinking it might work, is that essentially you're developing an infrastructure is being paid by um, out of the profits of oil and gas companies, um, and then it's in place. So then later you can use that infrastructure for other um, use case, maybe maybe power, maybe um, you know cement or something else. Um, so that's, that's something, but it's a bit controversial because it's actually, it has to be linked to a new oil and gas development or to, to sort of, you know, oil and gas development, which sometimes is, is kind of, um, you know, seen as, well, well, you know, you're mixing up things and, and et cetera, so. But I think, I think, I mean, this is really what this paper's about. It's about saying what other incentives do you need to put in place alongside carbon market and you know, where can you apply mandates to either drive through the value from the low-carbon products, so if it's cement or refinery, there'll be low-carbon building material, low-carbon fuel, and to actually put a, maybe see if there are any premiums on that to pull that through, but ultimately maybe you can start to mandate those things. You can also put mandates on, on uh, the production as well, um, or mandates for, for storage uh, in the offshore development. So I think that is really what we what we were here to discuss. So it's a very good question, and I don't think anybody's got the answers yet, really, about how which thing will be the most effective. I think the feeling is that we're waiting for, you know, the, the price of CO2 to get higher, but actually we just can't wait anymore. We actually have to get on with it. So governments that are putting in place contracts for difference, different mechanisms, maybe mandates, maybe product standards, I think are going to be able to move more quickly than, than others that just wait wait and watch. Um, Piers, you really wanted to come in earlier, so I think I might, we're about to close, so I think I might hand over to you really well, just to give God, I had final one more statement. Thing, just one more thing to say, and it comes back to a point that John did can this say right the, by the beginning, uh, and it's a question and a bit of a kind of challenge to all of you. I'm very sorry to end with, with a bit of, bit of a kind of challenge. But, but, but the amount of carbon we can remove, it definitely kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of finite. Uh, 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 and if that kind of finite, kind of, kind of finite amount is all taken up by developed countries and the really Kind of richest kind of companies like kind of Microsoft, the, the, the kind of then what do we do to support the developing countries? So 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 so, so I sort of think your industry and all of us do have a bit of obligation to not keep them kind of behind in this some way. Yeah, that's a good point. Does anyone want to come in on that as a final closing point? 
not sure if I'm answering uh, correctly here or uh, to your question, but I'm thinking it's been a lot of talk these days about leapfrogging, right? This technology is not new. We have worked on this for decades, and to be able to skip those 20, 30 years of development uh, of, of uh, using this, I mean, that is an opportunity that we can't miss out on. So, uh, yeah, that would be my take on it. And certainly just from our perspective as a CCSA, we've got increasingly international members. So we've got companies from around the world joining us, um, companies in India, Malaysia. They will learn from what is done in Europe very quickly. They'll invest and they are investing in those projects and they will learn and they will take that learning and deploy that around the world as, as will all the companies, I think. So I think I'm very encouraged to see that because I think it just goes to show that this is kind of a, a global effort and we are collaborating and it almost doesn't matter where the first ones are because so many companies are actually getting involved in them that that learning should then go around the world. And we see already some uh, global company looking at um, CCS project in uh, North Africa, in Morocco, for example, uh, or in uh, Latin America. Uh, because they are looking at the decarbonization of their global asset uh, fleet. Uh, and yes, probably the first one will be in uh, Europe or North America, uh, but the plan is to expand uh, further. Uh, so hopefully those uh, big international players will drive uh, the, the, the growth in developing countries. Fantastic. Well, thank you to the panel and thank you to the room. Uh, that was a great discussion. Uh, so just remains for to say thank you very much. <laughs>